Basically, I have something slightly more clinical. Diagnosing and treating acute HIV infection implications for HIV cure. Uh, nothing to disclose, but for the fact that you may uh, have become aware by now that the title probably should have been Diagnosing and Treating Acute HIV Infection, Possible Implications for HIV Cure, because Denise already, uh, at the end of her talk, talked about HIV remission, and that's, I think, uh, what we are striving for currently. The cure, uh, as James illustrated, takes uh, having a, a life-threatening malignancy and, and, and a bone marrow transplant at this time. So I think uh, what we're really aiming for is HIV remission. Ultimately, of course, a sterilizing cure, but, but one step at a time. So I want to define for you uh, how, to, uh, how to define acute HIV uh, infection and diagnose it remission and cure prospects, and then the impact of acute HIV treatment uh, beyond the reservoir as well. That's just some interesting clinical tidbits that we became aware of by, by having a pool of people who were treated that early. And if you then look at acute HIV infection, uh, in Bangkok we define it as any infection before FIBIC stage 6, before the Western blot has become completely uh, positive, and that is be, um, the roughly the first four to six weeks of infection. In FIBIC stage 1, as you may be aware, uh, there's only viral RNA detectable, then you get the antigen in FIBIC stage 2, and uh, the immune system starts kicking in in FIBIC stage 3, and that's also the stage when the viral load reaches extremely high levels compared to, for example, FIBIC stage 1, when they're still very low. So in acute infection, you uh, start to have cells being infected and the reservoir being established, as you are well aware by now, apparently within one week. Tissue uh, is infected and CD4 cells in the gut are depleted in large numbers. The immune system is getting exhausted. HIV starts mutating and evading the immune system. And uh, especially in populations where you have like um, concentrated epidemics in key populations, the HIV transmission uh, during acute infection may contribute as much as 50% to, to uh, the epidemic in some, according to some papers. Then at the Thai Red Cross Anonymous Clinic in Bangkok, how do we diagnose acute HIV infection? Basically, we've started a cohort in 2009 that I will allude to later in the talk. And basically, people come for the current standard fourth generation immune assay. Uh, over 10 years, it's been more than 300,000 people. People that test negative with research funding undergo pooled nucleic acid testing overnight in pools of 3 to 30 samples. And if the pool is negative, we do individual sampling. If the pool is positive, we do individual sampling. And that way, we have uh, identified 185 individuals in FIBIC 1 2. The rest of them are negative. And then for people that test reactive, we do sequential uh, testing with third and second generation immunoassays. And if you're still negative on your second generation test, we also consider you to be in uh, acute HIV infection. And that way we have identified 770 acute HIV infections among 300,000 plus. So we're really looking at needles in haystacks in some way. Um, this is very early, the text at the bottom is from very early in this effort when we only had 112 identified. And then Mark D'Souza published in AIDS that by having included the net testing in this whole algorithm, we identified 38% more acute infections and uh, we increased the price per individual screen by 22% by doing that. So this, this is uh, cost effective, I think. In, in, it's done in urban centers in the US and Europe as well. If you, if you look at epidemics in concentrated, uh, concentrated epidemics in key populations, it's highly recommended. Um, in the general population, it may be less cost effective. Then, um, as a clinician, if you don't have access to this, but uh, there are still opportunities to diagnose um, acute infection simply by diagnosing the acute retroviral syndrome, we looked back when we had 430 cases included uh, and saw that 335 had presented with ARS. The most common symptoms were fever, fatigue, and pharyngitis. And unfortunately, uh, these lead to very few referrals because they're so unspecific. When we do get referrals from the community, it's mostly for viral uh, rash or for ulcers because they, they trigger more suspicion among the referring clinicians. And then um, also acute retroviral syndrome really kicks in at the later FIBIC stages when the viral load starts to peak. So in FIBIC stages 3, 4, and 5, we saw it in 72% of participants in FIBIC stages 1 and 2, only 28% of the volunteers had experienced or were experienced antiretroviral syndrome and these were only a median of five days apart from the estimated time of infection. 
Then uh, these 770 people that we identified, they have been approached to go into a cohort study that's been ongoing since 2009. 610, that's, that's a remarkable thing in Thailand, that the willingness to participate in cohorts and study is very high. 80% of people um, agreed to go into the cohort. And then that cohort aims to describe the clinical, immunological and virological characteristics of acute infection to limit the reservoir with the early ART and then to identify volunteers for the studies that James just described. Um, I didn't put that in the slide, but these people are 80% infected with the most common subtype in Thailand, CRF AE01, and we have about 40% in FIBIC 1-2, 40% in FIBIC 3, and then 20% in the later FIBIC stages. The same slide you saw from James, uh, basically why are we so interested, as said, the Berlin patient is the only one uh, long term cured, the London patient is following and hopefully the Dusseldorf patient as well after all they have gone through, but what we were really interested in is these people, as James already said, that were all treated uh, early and that then were either off ART for a limited but protracted period or are still uh, controlling their HIV on their own like the Visconti participants. That's how the interest I think mostly started. The Visconti cohort was first described in 2013 in uh, PLOS pathogens by uh, Hulek. And then basically these were then 14, now 24 individuals uh, identified in France and now I believe beyond France as well. They all started ART during primary infection. They do not resemble elite controllers, on the contrary. Some of them have uh, HLA profiles that in the natural course of infection could be detrimental. And they interrupted therapy mostly on their own uh, because they wanted to after three and a half years of treatment. And some now have been followed for 12 years, or they've all been followed for 12 years. Five have restarted ART, five for viral load increases, one for head and neck cancer, but it means that uh, 17 really have complete control of their virus some 12 years out. So that's, that's why we are so um, bullish in trying to, to find the remission. Uh, then John Lee at Harvard and his group looked at 14 studies in the US where people interrupted treatment, both in chronic infection and people that were treated since early infection. And then what they found, they call it a CHAMP study, is that they defined, first of all, viral control uh, much more loosely. They said if you have a viral load of less than 400 copies per mil at two-thirds of time points for at least 24 weeks, we consider you a controller. And then they found 67 of people who met those criteria among a group that was not numbered, but you can deduct it from the percentages later. And then uh, 38 of those had started ART during early infection, and they then calculated that people in early, treated in early infection have 13% to be controlled by their definition, and in chronic infection, 4%. So we, we still uh, also see here that being treated early has an advantage in uh, controlling your HIV. 55% maintain control for two years, 20% for five years, so only 20% are starting to resemble the Visconti patients from this group. Then the Spartak investigators in Oxford only very recently uh, published this paper uh, where they uh, had uh, 22 African women who initiated ART during primary HIV infection, so not even acute infection, and five of them are maintaining viral load of less than 400 copies for a median of 188 weeks by now after treatment interruption. So that's, that's much higher uh, than, than 4 or 14% uh, even. So then basically, um, what are we doing with the acute uh, treatment, the acute infection treatment? We know that from the previous speakers, RNA-wise, 93% of our volunteers in Bangkok have viral control at 24 weeks and stay there. And then this is the DNA slide again. This line above here, the chronically infected volunteers, is not the original Silicano line, but this is uh, Thai controls, so they, they follow that paper uh, to, the, to the T. And then you see people in FIBIC uh, 2 to 4 and FIBIC 1 participants who have uh, DNA decline very, very rapidly. And I think that uh, James' talk illustrated why uh, the, the biggest implication for uh, cure research is simply that these people present a unique opportunity because we are up against major obstacles and what these people represent is a small reservoir and thereby proof of concept studies, we hope and believe that proof of concept studies 
will show uh, a signal easier and there is less obstacles to overcome in this population because ultimately what we're talking about here today if it's not applicable to the larger HIV infected population or also chronically infected people it will have little clinical use down the line but why are we focusing on acute infection because we simply have less obstacles to overcome there and we hope to be able to show what is promising here first then um, the volunteers in Bangkok also have a high willingness to uh, donate samples. We have 50% of volunteers are willing to undergo one or more invasive procedures. And what you see here is that these are the volunteers at baseline, blood, colon, cells and lymph node tissue. And uh, at the bottom you see them after one to two years on ART. And especially in the FIBIC 1 and 2s you see that you make significant uh, differences with ART in reducing, this is the integrated HIV DNA. Uh, and the FIBIC ones are special again in that they have very little uh, DNA to start with. This is done by Nicolas Chaumont in uh, Montreal, by the way. Then, um, by giving early treatment also beyond the reservoir, we, we managed to make these volunteers look more like HIV uninfected volunteers than chronically infected HIV uh, volunteers in some ways. Here you're looking at inflammatory markers, CRP and uh, soluble CD4. And then the, the interrupted line here at the top is the level of these in HIV infected volunteers, chronically in HIV infected volunteers. The bottom line is HIV negative people. And if we start treating our volunteers in acute infection, they all start resembling HIV negative volunteers more than chronically infected volunteers. Um, oh, and the same, what I just showed you, one slide back, yeah, the same uh, we do in, for example, CSF, and you see the same phenomenon. So if you look at Neopterin or IP10 in CSF, you also see uh, a near normalization that you will not see in chronically infected individuals. This is lymph node tissue. The left here is an HIV negative volunteer in Thailand. And on the right, you see somebody who started ART within two weeks of infection and two to four weeks of infection. And these are representative of larger groups that Timothy Shecker in Minnesota has looked at. And in Thailand, an HIV negative individual has about 10% collagen deposition in his or her lymph nodes. That's more than in most Western populations, less than in Africa. So it's also environment and uh, uh, ethnicity dependent probably. And then ART started uh, within two weeks, leads to an increase of about uh, 3%. These people over time have 13% collagen deposition and delaying ART by only two more weeks leads already to a near doubling of your collagen deposition uh, long term in your lymph nodes. So by starting very early, you are again more skewed towards the HIV negative picture than the HIV chronic picture. Then um, also, what uh, we were able to show in that 411 study again that Denise talked about, led by Don Colby. You see here data on three participants in that study. Could we be harming people by starting that early? Are we uh, impeding HIV specific immune responses? So uh, are, do we give these people a chance to respond themselves properly? And then you see here these FIBIC1 participants indeed, when uh, they were enrolled in the study, when they started their ART, we could barely detect any uh, very HIV specific CD8 cell responses. But then they went into the study, interrupted ART, rebounded, and at the time of rebound, they had a very rapid expansion of HIV specific CD8 cells. So um, this suggests that we are not harming with very early treatment in that sense. Then um, if we look at the phylogenetics, basically these people have very low vi viral diversity compared to a chronically infected individual and that diversity also did not increase uh, over time on ART which is to be expected, but it's nicely shown here. So these are the sequences between acute infection and a time of rebound, and they suggest a lack of viral replication during therapy. So all positive. Then at the same time, this is that famous picture again of the RV411. They all rebounded. So uh, we're, we're up against uh, tremendous uh, yeah, challenges. So then, do we know uh, what's in our way? Well, of course, the, the persistent reservoir as um, alluded to by Denise. And then, for example, what we also see is Alex Schutz in Bangkok showed that if we start treating in FIBIC-1, we manage to prevent the loss of the CD4 cells in the gut mucosa, but at FIBIC-3, we're already no longer able to prevent that and we never get these cells back up to normal levels. So here you definitely do not like an HIV-negative volunteer if you start treatment early. 
And then uh, this one, uh, I think, is most uh, illustrative. Illustrative. This is about the lymph nodes, where we, uh, as Denise already said, um, are probably up uh, for the biggest battle. What Timothy Shecker showed is that despite your collagen in FIBIC1 being very low if you start treatment early, he also did see in FIBIC1s the highest percentage of sample with viral RNA positive cells. So while the absolute number of uh, the absolute amount of viral RNA was very low in these individuals, the percentage of samples with any detectable viral RNA was the highest. So um, I'm not saying that the lymph node where, is where it's all happening, it's clearly happening all over, but there's definitely a lot happening in the lymph node. And then again, uh, while we're holding on, is this is a therapeutic vaccine study we recently completed in Bangkok where 25 of 26 volunteers rebounded very rapidly. Uh, at a median of 20 days, but then again there was one placebo participant, so he was not in the active vaccine arm and he's been holding out for one and a half years now. And uh, he is the first sort of like Visconti-like participant we have identified in the Bangkok cohort. And uh, that's I think uh, to, to elucidate what's going on in these people and why they control is what, what keeps us going. And then just a few tidbits that we were able to uh, to identify because we treat people so early. This is from uh, when we had about 400 people in the cohort. By using very conservative modeling uh, with David, uh, oh, what's his name again? Sorry. Uh, we did this with a group in Sydney. Basically, they were able to uh, show that by uh, addressing acute infection in this concentrated epidemic in, in MSM, we managed to reduce the number of ongoing transmissions from this cohort by 89%. If so, if not for any other reason, it's worth to identify acute infection for this reason alone if you're dealing with an infection, say, in, in, in key populations in your, in your practice. Then this is an article by Mark de Souza, uh, also earlier on in the study, where he showed that um, this is the fourth generation immunoassay, that a, there was a lot of uh, non-reactivity on the fourth generation immunoassay, of course in our study because people are uh, early in infection. The second generation assay was of course non-reactive in everybody at baseline because uh, they had to be in acute infection. Then while they were treated, they became mostly seropositive, but again, the phoebic ones did predominantly not. The third generation assay was actually the best at identifying uh, the infection in these individuals on therapy over time. And uh, that's, I think, important for our practices that the fourth generation immunoassay is, is maybe not the most useful one in these populations. Then Mark Manek at MHRP in the same cohort did more testing with three different uh, HIV antigen antibody combo tests that came out only uh, last week. And he showed that uh, at week 12 and week 24 on therapy of the FIBIC ones, 52% had a non-reactive uh, test at one or both time points, 7.7% in FIBIC2 and 4.5% in FIBIC3-4. So the FIBIC1 stand out there again. And uh, the genius and Western blot were also negative or indeterminate in a substantial number of people. So diagnostics are, are problematic once you are an ART period, but uh, especially in very early treated individuals. This is a slide from uh, Don Colby's talk of yesterday and the poster will be out uh, after this session, poster number three. And this is people who started PrEP during acute infection. They were uh, later identified by either the, the pooled aptima or the individual aptima, but they were started based on a negative four generation test. And what was very interesting is that uh, thus far, it's a very low number, but thus far the people that were uh, warned and discontinued their PrEP early, within two weeks, we were not able to find any resistance mutations, but in the ones that continued PrEP for a month or longer, those three individuals showed an M184i or M184v mutation. Um, not really a cause for alarm in the sense that th this is clearly very, very rare. I mean, very few people will be started on PrEP in uh, acute infection. In our clinic, it's about one in 350 right now. And if you are able to call them back early enough, then you can prevent further damage. But this would require to do net testing. And then the last uh, slide I have is about uh, diagnosis at very low viral load levels. I don't know if that's uh, come up in your practices, but in Thailand, many uh, clinicians will still be reluctant to diagnose HIV at a viral load of less than 5,000 based on the guidelines that are still in place 
on testing methods from 15 years ago. They have improved and we had a unique opportunity to look at that. So we have 54 participants who were diagnosed with a, a, a infection at a viral load below 5,000 copies. The median was 753. They then all got tested again at a median of three days later when their viral load had gone up by 1.3 uh, log and 57% by then had an RNA of more than 5,000 copies per mil. Three who had a drop were uh, the three who had started PEP on the day of the initial test. There were no false positive HIV RNA tests as everybody tested positive again on the repeat test. And again, um, the third generation test did better at weeks 12 and weeks 24 in these people. Uh, 87 and 85 percent respectively were positive at those time points with a third generation test, while only 58 and 47 percent tested positive uh, with a fourth generation assay in our hands. So uh, we, we feel very confident that uh, if you have a confirmed HIV RNA, quantitative HIV RNA, that you can diagnose HIV infection based, based on RNA alone. And that was my last slide, and happy to take any questions. I wanted to thank Dr. Jintanat Ananwaranit. Uh, she's not here today, neither is Dr. Vassan. She led this cohort uh, yeah, with Verve really for 10 years. It's all that I presented is here because of her. And Dr. Sandy Vassan has taken over for her, and I just wanted to wish her long distance uh, very good luck in keeping us going. And that's all.